This movie is going to introduce you to the new iJet system from Mortcher. It's a single-use injector system that's been carefully designed to enable the controlled and safe implantation of a preloaded capsule attention ring. There are two styles of ring that can be implanted using the iJet system. The standard model is number 14, and the type 14C is the ring that's routinely inserted before FACO in most cases of sonular deficiency. Both styles come in a choice of three sizes, listed here as their uncompressed diameters. The standard uncompressed diameter is 13 mm and represented by models 14C and 13A. Both styles are available in two other sizes, the smaller diameter of 12.5 mm and a larger diameter of 14.5 mm. This has been designed for use in larger myopic eyes. The Type 13 ring has a soft nose curve on its leading end. This has been designed for ease of insertion into an empty and floppy capsular bag with compromised sonular support. The gentle elbow presents a broad area of contact that glides more easily against the bag equator. This reduces the risk of the leading end snagging against the bag on the way round and causing a capsular tear. So now let's move on to show you the straightforward preparation of the iJet system for use in surgery. The non-sterile packaging is open to access the sterile container inside, which is then handed to the scrub nurse. The sealed cover of this container is then peeled off. The iJet is supplied like this, with the trailing end of the ring already pre-engaged by its eyelet onto the tip of the plunger. The ring then just has to be loaded into the injector. This is achieved simply by pulling the C-clamp that's attached to the plunger until the open end of the clamp overrides the body of the injector. This action withdraws the ring into the nozzle. And finally, the C-clamp is unclipped from the plunger by sliding it sideways. The iJet is now ready for use. There are two different versions of the injector that are available, a right and a left. The injector body and the ring itself are identical in each case, but the ring is mounted differently. The right injector delivers the ring clockwise to the right, and the left injector delivers it anti-clockwise to the left. This is designed so that the ring can be implanted from either direction, whilst its trailing end will always be released in the same downward direction from the end of the tip. The situation where these options are very useful is when there's a localized sonular dehiscence like this. Under these circumstances, the ring should be injected towards the area of the defect, so that the adjacent sonules are compressed and supported rather than stretched in the opposite direction. It's only possible to do this if the ring can be delivered in either direction, depending on the location of the sonular defect. Now let's look at the details of the surgical technique for implanting a ring using the iJet system. Here's a typical case with diffuse sonular laxity from pseudo-exfoliation. Iris hooks have been used to enlarge the predictably small pupil. With an elective or cold case like this, it's always wisest to support the zonules with a tension ring early on, before you start to FACO. There are two important preparatory steps in these planned cases. The first is a thorough subcapsular cortical cleaving hydrodissection. This has a number of benefits. It defines the subcapsular space for implantation of the ring, ensures that the nucleus is freely mobile for endocapsular FACO, and also minimizes the amount of cortex that ends up trapped between the ring and the bag, as this will need to be meticulously stripped out later on. The second step that's helpful is to open up the subcapsular plane with a viscoelastic. You can do this visco dissection locally or all the way around under the rexis. It helps not only to maintain the subcapsular space for easy insertion of the ring, but it also keeps the cortical fibers flattened down and out of the way. With the stage now set, the first step of implantation is to guide the leading eyelet of the ring under the edge of the rexis. Once in place, the ring is then slowly and gently injected into the subcapsular space. Its high flexibility ensures that the ring compresses very easily and conforms to the contour of the bag with minimal resistance. Because the crystalline lens is still in place in these cases, the capsule remains under tension, so the ring will continue to pass smoothly around the equator of the bag without snagging. A very useful feature of the iJet is that it has a transparent nozzle. This enables the surgeon to see exactly when the injection of the ring is nearing completion, as the tip of the plunger becomes visible. 
This allows for controlled delivery of the trailing end of the ring as it emerges from the nozzle. The eyelet is easily disengaged from the small hook on the end of the plunger, usually just by lifting it up against the resistance of the edge of the rexis. The ring then spontaneously expands under its own elasticity. With a good hydrodissection and accurate subcapsular placement of the ring, you should be left with an almost empty bag at the end of FACO. Very little residual cortex remains, which makes the I&A very much easier. Most of this residual cortex will strip off radially as normal if it isn't trapped by the ring. In this case, only a few subincisional fibers are trapped by the ring. So when they're stripped off, the ring is flexed centrally and the leading eyelet appears from just under the pupil margin, behind the irrigation cannula. More than anything, this demonstrates the high flexibility and ready compliance of the Morcher ring. The end result shows a well-centered lens and a stable capsular bag. Implanting a capsular tension ring into an empty and floppy capsular bag with zonular deficiency is a particularly challenging problem. Even with a bag fully inflated with viscoelastic, it's easy for the leading end of a standard ring to snag the capsule as it drags against it. When this happens, characteristic tension folds develop in the posterior capsule, as seen here, directed towards the point where the tip has become snagged against the bag. The use of further force at this stage to try and push it past the obstruction is likely to tear the capsule and inject the ring into the vitreous cavity. One solution to this problem is to use the Type 13 ring, which, as outlined earlier, has a soft-nosed curve or elbow on the leading end that's been specifically designed for gliding easily into an empty capsular bag. Before implanting the ring, be sure first to completely fill the capsular bag with a cohesive OVD to put the bag under tension. Then guide the leading elbow of the Type 13 ring under the edge of the rexis and gently inject the ring, being careful to remain vigilant for any increased resistance or evidence of tension folds in the posterior capsule. The trailing haptic is released from the tip of the plunger in the usual way and then the lens implant can be inserted as normal. We hope this movie has clearly demonstrated to you the benefits and correct technique for using the iJet injector. It's a new single-use system from Morcha, which has been carefully designed to facilitate the safe implantation of types 13 and 14 capsular tension rings in situations where zonular support has been compromised. Hopefully, you'll find it a valuable addition to your selection of surgical devices that lead to improved outcomes in challenging cases of cataract surgery.